guys, welcome back to the STEM channel. I'm Steph Evs and we're doing a segment that I haven't done in a really long time, Topic Talk, yay! So what is this week's topic you might be asking? Well, it is not the science behind why girls' pockets are so small in their jeans. No, no, it's Orbital Mechanics 101, or as I like to call it, my favorite class in college. Now we're gonna be keeping everything really basic in this video, but if you wanna learn more information, feel free to contact me and I can either answer your questions or I can direct you to a source that'll answer it for you. So the best way to start off here, let's start with the history. Now as most great science and math stories do, this story starts way back with the Greeks back in around 600 BC when they initially started to form ideas about planetary motion. But it wasn't until around 500 BC when Pythagoras of Pythagorean theorem fame really took it to the next level. Pythagoras proposed that the Earth was spherical, and as we all know, that theorem totally stuck and was never questioned again as long as anybody lived. And that was it. No one ever thought that the world was flat again. In around 370 BC, a gentleman named Exodus came up with the geocentric theory, which stated that Earth was at the center of the universe, because, you know, humans have to always be the center of everything. While Exodus was the guy that initially came up with geocentric theory, Aristotle was more famous for actually adopting it. In the 3rd century BC, a gentleman named Aristarchus proposed the heliocentric theory, which placed the sun at the center of the universe rather than the earth. And we know today that we're not realistically at the center of the universe, but this was actually a lot closer than putting earth at the center of everything, so we'll take it. In his model, Aristarchus proposed that there were six planets on circular orbits around the sun orbiting at uniform rates. Now, while this was a huge step in developing how our solar system looked, it's not exactly accurate, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Aristarchus also took a crack at calculating the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and he came up with about 4 million miles, which is only about 88 to 92 million miles off depending on the day of the year. Due to its inaccuracy, heliocentric theory was eventually abandoned. Jumping way ahead to 150 AD, we meet a gentleman named Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy is important because he would predict planetary motion using geocentric theory and these little things called epicycles. To put it very simply, epicycles are little tiny circular motions that a planet makes while on orbit around a larger object. Basically, what these epicycles allowed Ptolemy to do was to fudge his data just enough to fit in his predicted model. Jumping way ahead to the Middle Ages, known for their forward thinking and plagues, the first gentleman we meet is Nicholas Copernicus, who calculated the planetary motion using the heliocentric theory. Yay! But he still used those bleeping epicycles. Boo! Now, going back to that forward thinking that I was talking about, Copernicus actually had his work published after his death to avoid persecution by the church. While this may have kept him out of jail, it didn't keep his work from getting banned by the church in 1616. Yeah. Another very important gentleman from this particular time period is Johannes Kepler. To give you a teeny tiny idea of just how important Kepler was, we actually have three laws of planetary motion called Kepler's Laws. So yeah, that should clue you and then he was big time. One big concept that he introduced was the concept of elliptic orbits. Gasp! Not everything is a perfect circle in the universe. It might be shaped like an oval instead. <gasps> Moving on to a gentleman I'm sure you've never heard of, Galileo Galilei. Yeah, I thought so. Galileo is really important because he introduced a lot of the concepts of dynamics and kinematics that we actually still use in physics today. Galileo also had a run-in with the church, but he wasn't as fortunate as Copernicus, you know, being already dead. So instead they just stuck him in prison for the last eight years of his life. Yay, forward thinking! The last gentleman we're going to talk about from this era is Sir Isaac Newton. No, he did not invent the bleepin' cookie! Again, three laws of motion named after him, so he's probably pretty important. But he almost wasn't important. In fact, if Edmund Haley hadn't urged him to publish his works, we would have missed out on tons of really outstanding concepts that he came up with, such as calculus. So yes, high school seniors in AP calculus right now, now you know who to blame. All of those names that I mentioned are incredibly important to not only orbital mechanics studies, but also to physics as a whole. Without them, there would be no Albert Einsteins or Robert Goddards or even Werner von Braun's. So thank you, gentlemen. So moving on, let's talk basic orbital components. Now I'm not going to get really complex here and there are a lot that I'm skipping, but like I said, if you're really curious, you can either read up on it or contact me and I'd be more than happy to provide you with some additional information. One really important component of orbits is the orbital period or the time it takes for the object to orbit completely around whatever body it's orbiting. For Earth orbiting around the sun, the orbital period is 365 days or 365 and a quarter if you want to get really technical. Yay, leap year! Two more important orbital components are perigee and apogee. 
or periapsis, perijove, perihelion, and apoapsis, aphelion, apogeove. But for simplicity's sake, let's stick to perigee and apogee. Perigee is the point in an orbit when the object is closest to whatever body it's orbiting, and apogee is the exact opposite, the furthest point in an orbit. The distance between these two points is known as the major axis, and if you cut it in half, you get the semi-major axis, and there's also the semi-minor axis. I'll put a picture here so that you can see what they look like on an elliptic orbit. Another important orbital component is the true anomaly, or the angle between the direction of perigee and the current position of the orbiting body, as you can see here. The final component that we're going to talk about is eccentricity. To put it very simply, eccentricity defines exactly how far an orbit varies from a perfectly circular orbit. So now let's talk orbital shapes and how eccentricity ties in with those. For a circular orbit, which as you may have guessed is a circle, the eccentricity is zero, meaning that it does not vary at all from a circular orbit. In a circular orbit, the semi-major axis is the radius of the circle, which would make sense, and there's really no apogee or perigee or their equivalent, however you want to look at it. In a circular orbit, the orbiting body has constant speed, constant angular speed, constant potential energy, and constant kinetic energy. That is, as long as there's no extra propulsion kicking it around. Moving on to an elliptic orbit, or a stretched out circle slash oval shaped orbit, now you have an eccentricity between 0 and 1. An elliptic orbit is known as a negative energy escape trajectory or orbit because the object doesn't actually ever escape an elliptic orbit, it just keeps going around and around. This orbit is the most common orbit in our solar system, seen as planets and comets and even asteroids all have elliptic shaped orbits. That's right, although some planetary orbits do come close to circular, they are all elliptic orbits. Now the speeds in an elliptic orbit vary based on how close you are to perigee or apogee. At perigee, the object is moving the fastest, and apogee, it's moving the slowest. So in effect, it just keeps getting slingshot around whatever it's orbiting and then falling back towards it. The next orbits we're going to talk about are parabolic orbits and hyperbolic orbits. Now these kind of are probably going to seem a little bit similar, but I'll talk about the differences. Let's start with a parabolic orbit. Now for those of you that haven't taken higher level math classes, a parabola has a U shape, which is exactly what the orbit looks like. Parabolic orbits have an eccentricity equal to 1, and they are known as minimum energy escape trajectories, meaning that the orbiting object has just enough energy to break completely free of the gravitational force and continue to do not into space. Now, parabolic orbits do have a point of perigee, but their point of apogee gets a little bit trickier since they're just shooting off into infinity, so that's what it is. Apogee is equal to infinity on parabolic orbits. Now, hyperbolic orbits are similar to parabolic orbits in the fact that they are U-shaped, but they have an eccentricity greater than 1, and they are known as positive energy escape trajectories. Much like a parabolic orbit, since the object never returns, the point of apogee is infinity. Now, eccentricity or shape isn't the only way to classify orbits. For example, you can classify orbits based on what is being orbited. A heliocentric orbit is orbiting the sun, geocentric orbit is orbiting the earth, lunar orbit is orbiting the moon, I can keep going, but you get the idea, I think. You can also classify orbits by their synchrosity, or how much the orbit syncs up with the rotation of the planet. There's geosynchronous orbits, which means that the orbiting body is completely synced up with Earth's rotation, so it's constantly above the same exact point on Earth, even as Earth turns. You can also classify orbits based on their altitude. If you've ever tuned into a NASA broadcast, I'm sure you've heard the term LEO, which stands for Low Earth Orbit. Low Earth Orbit is a geocentric orbit of no greater than 2,000 kilometers, or 1,240 miles. To put this into perspective, the International Space Station hangs out at around 400 kilometers, or about 250 miles. That may not seem like a lot, and it's really not. In fact, if the International Space Station was completely steady and wasn't moving, and you had a highway that ran straight up, you could probably get there in about four hours. I'll include a link in the description down below that takes you to the website where you can see when and where to view the International Space Station. I highly encourage any of you to go and actually check this out sometime. It's pretty cool. So that's it for this week's Topic Talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was educational. If you have any more topics that you'd like to know more about, feel free to tweet them at me at atstephevs43 on Twitter using the hashtag Topic Talk. Also, don't forget, I'm collecting really cool STEM news stories for this week's Twistem episode, so if you find any of those throughout the week, also tweet those at me using the hashtag Twistem. If you like this video and you want to see many more like it, feel free to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you want to check me out on any of my other social media, I will include those in the description down below. But that's it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned something, and I will see you on Saturday.